right, good morning, everybody. Whoa. I haven't turned it on yet, so you haven't been able to play with it. I'm going to turn it off real soon. All right. Good morning. Let me just keep talking. Mic test. Check one, check two. Can you guys hear me? All right, guys. My name is Kellis, pastor here at Berean Community Fellowship. I want to welcome you guys. We can expect a lot of the usual. We're going to sing some songs about Jesus. Who's the man? Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And then we're going to get into God's word. Uh, but first, announcements. There's a couple announcements that are really important. And guys, I've been dropping the ball. I really have. I've been wide open. I apologize. The kids backpacking trip. I haven't given you guys your packing list. If you have a packing list from the previous trips, it's probably going to be the same thing, uh, but, but essentially, no phone, no anything that smells, no deodorant, um, no, what else, what, else, what other things we said, no watches, um, but just gear that it's going to keep you warm, gear that they can play in, uh, some polyester would be better, um, some things like that. So I'll get you guys a packing list. You should be able to get everything together. You don't have to have a backpack. Really, the Savages need to be hearing this, so you guys help me relay that to them. Um, but you don't have to have a backpack. We're not actually going to be doing some backpacking. We're just going to be canoeing uh, and then staying in one spot. So you don't have to have the, uh, the external frame or internal frame backpack like we have in the past. But uh, work on your snacks. You guys are going to want to put together, uh, you can have, uh, like, like trail mix, things like that, things that they can have during the day. Uh, we will have a lunch, but pr our primary meals are going to be breakfast uh, and dinner. Dinner is the one thing you get they don't have to worry about. Uh, they do need to bring their breakfast. They'll be doing um, like oatmeal, instant stuff, power bars are fine, stuff like that. So we'll talk more about that. Stay on me. Don't let me wait to the last minute to give you guys a huge packing list. That's coming up. The weekend is still the same, though. It's going to be the 30th and the 31st. So we're going to be leaving that Friday evening. Uh, and then coming back Sunday morning. Now, one of the things that we'd like to do, I don't know if you guys are up for this. Let me get some vetoes or, or some, some, some yays. How about let's have church down there? Can we do that? Yeah. That way we don't miss anything. Yeah. We're just, I mean, we can, we can do whatever we want. You know, we'll just put a sign on the door. We went to the lake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but let's have church down there. That would be so much fun. Now, it, we can carpool, we can caravan, we can, we'll give the directions out, um, but we could just meet down there at the camp. Um, we, can, we can eat down there. Shoot, we could do a bunch of stuff. And then just have a, just, all right, anybody, anybody adamantly opposed to this? It, well, can we meet indoors? We can meet indoors. Do you want a tent? Yeah, for sure. No, no, it, 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 it's got like cabins and indoor. We can, we can be indoor. Yeah. So, yeah, weather, we'll, we're fine there. Um, we'll talk it out. We got a month, but, but uh, let's do it. I think that'd be super fun. Um, all right, so another announcement, guys. This Tuesday is kind of a big deal. I'm really excited. This is my final opportunity to speak at Mosaic, which is the, the student-led, uh, what do you guys call it? Like just worship service on campus. Uh, been building up truth, talking about essentially looking at Jesus and his uh, claim to testify to the truth, and he's reliable, we can trust him. Then we talked about Paul and the trustworthiness of Scripture, and so all that lead, okay, so now that we, we have a credible and reliable source, what is the gospel? What is the truth? And so that's what I'm hopefully, Lord willing, just going to lay out the gospel as clearly as I can on Tuesday. So I'm excited. One of the things we're doing to get people there is we're offering waffles from our store. We're going to be kicking world ch life changing, world famous waffles, giving those out for free. Um, they are life changing, you guys know. Um, and so I need some volunteers with that. And then actually, our church is doing everything at the service. We're actually leading the worship. And so I've been looking at the things that the students do. And I just want to replace and replace them essentially and do everything that they do so that they can all just fully engage. So they have visitors, I mean, uh, not visitors, uh, greeters at the doors. We need some greeters. So I need you guys. If you guys can show up this Tuesday at, I guess it starts at 7 no, 7.30? They show up around 7. They're out there at 7 because I came early this past week. If you could be there at 7 to help stand at the doors and just welcome the students in 
And if they walk by close enough, just grab them and pull them in. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> would that be okay? That'd be okay. All right, you wouldn't get in trouble. Uh, so, yeah, so seriously, just grab them. Um, and then we need, we probably won't touch their sound system, so we're good there. We'll, they'll have to do that. Uh, and then our worship band is going to be there. They're going to be leading music. In fact, we've got everybody out there, uh, all of them, everybody, all of our musicians, except for Kelvin. Where's Kelvin? Kelvin's not going to be there. But you could be. You could, you could join the party uh, and lead. And, but anyway, so we, um, yeah, I hope you guys can make it. We, we need some help serving the waffles, too. So, guys, please, I'm going to be walking around. Just, I said, we're just going to do this. It, show of hands. How many of you guys are able and willing to come Tuesday night to help out? I know. Okay, sweet. Guys, thank you. Okay. Okay. No, you guys, you know, you can't do anything because you do stuff every week. You can't do anything. You just have to, like, act normal. Um, okay, so I need help. If you guys could be there at 7 o'clock. Uh, we'll be there a little early. We're going to start cooking waffles. I'll have my family, since we cook the waffles, cooking them. But I'm going to have a couple of people helping prepare them and handing them out. Um, we'll just have a couple toppings. We'll do, like, Nutella, some strawberries, some just, just sweet ones. We'll hand those out. Um, and then uh, we'll see who else is there, and we'll put you guys at the doors just welcoming. You remember, because you guys, you came last week with the boys, um, just how they were. They, they were standing there and saying, hey, welcome. Come on in, just, just do that. Super easy, all right? And then we could do all that here the next week. We did greeters and waffles every Sunday. I like the way this church is developing. <laughs> all right, any other announcements? Those are the main ones. Oh, no, I got another one. I'm sorry, hold on. The parenting class. Uh, how many of you guys were at the parent cla parenting class this past Wednesday? Holly was. Oh, Keely and James. Okay. Uh, did you guys discuss your plans for this week since Brent and Shelly are on vacation? Okay, well, they're the leaders, so I guess you guys aren't having it. <laughs> okay, so there's no parenting class this week. Uh, all right, so that means we're free to meet. <laughs> Uh, so let's meet up on, on Wednesday, and we'll talk about some stuff. No, I, I, I need to. I got I to gotta do it, babe. Um, so we'll pick back up the following week um, on the parenting class. One of the things that I heard uh, about, uh, it was a family that came, and they didn't bring their kids, is that, oh, we just didn't want to be too much for you guys. Callie and I have been wanting to really just have an opportunity to pour into the, the younger kids, not just the college, for, for years, really. And we've done some things here and there. But so we, Callie and I are actually preparing stuff. We're going through this study by Henry Blackaby, Experiencing God for Youth. We're taking the kids through that. So um, if you have kids, bring them. We want to pour into them. Don't just say, hey, we're, we'll make it easy on them by letting them stay home. Bring them. We want to pour into them. We've been taking the kids down to the, uh, to the park right there. We'll play some games. And then we can turn on the lights under that gazebo. Uh, and we're going to go through this Bible study. So yeah, please bring your kids. Let Callie and I pour into them. Uh, at least for this, this next eight weeks. So, all right, those are the announcements. Anything else? Anything else going on in your guys' life? We've got a bunch of people who are out. Let's pray for the Consavages. They're up in Hodgenville right now uh, at that Lincoln Jamboree celebration thing. They're, uh, Noah and Alexia are main, mainlining it. What do you call them? Like, they're, they're leading it. I mean, they're singing like 20 minutes, so they're up there supporting their family. Uh, Dan and Rebecca, are, they're out. The Jennings are out. Who else are we missing, guys? This is one of the things that we do. Uh, Lisa, yeah, Lisa went back to Colorado to visit her mom. Um, my grandmother-in-law, I guess I can call her that. I've never called her my grandmother-in-law. <laughs> How far can you go with the, with the grandma, with the in-laws? Okay. Um, so, yeah, she'll be coming back Tuesday. Um, if you guys notice someone not here, like you look around and you're like, oh, I don't see them. Reach out to them, guys. This is huge. I've been really trying to push this, especially during COVID. We did a terrible job with, with reaching out and telling people we miss them. We did a terrible job. We failed in that department. Um, Facebook is not sufficient <laughs> that you see them on Facebook and you know they're healthy. You got to call them. You got to message them. Um, so if you guys see somebody or don't see somebody and you notice them or you don't notice them, uh, please reach out. <laughs> reach out to them, please, this week. All right. I give you guys time to think about it. Any other announcements? Things, something you guys want to share with the church body? Yeah, Kelly. Yeah. Okay. 
We've been discussing a few things about uh, just participating in the community. We want to be a part of the community uh, as much as we can. As one of, we're, we're one of those unique churches where almost all of us are not from here. Uh, we're a transplant church, except for, <laughs> for y'all. But even y'all, y'all went to Indiana for a long time. I mean, uh, so we uh, are, have to be extra, really extra deliberate in getting involved in the community. And one of the things that they do every year is they have the Christmas parade. It was brought up, the idea of maybe us putting a float in it. Anybody adamantly opposed to that? We're not going to have Santa Claus on there. I mean, but if we did, no judgment, okay? It's grace. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, 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 if you guys are interested, I want to start talking about this. Exactly, I was just about to say that. Are we married or something? Oh my gosh. We just <laughs> okay, I'll stop there. Okay. <laughs> we, uh, I, I want to do it. So if you guys have any ideas, let, let, let's start tossing them out there. Let's start working on it. Uh, and I need someone else to really kind of help me out because you guys know me. I'm like all or nothing. So I'm like those Griswolds. Like we're bringing it out, you know. <laughs> Like, let's just go all out. I want them to see us from space. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to need someone to help moderate that, you know, and let's make sure it's, it's, it's not too extravagant. But let's do it. It'd be fun. It'd be super fun. So uh, I really am that way. So please help me. <laughs> all right. I love you guys. Musici musicians, come on up. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And it's all about you. And I thank you for the opportunity for us to gather again together. Um, Lord, let this time be deliberate. Some of us are on vacation. Some of us are uh, just, just glad to, to get out, you know, and taking a break. And uh, some of us are here and we're hungry. Lord, let us, all, let us all have ears to hear. No matter what we have going on this afternoon or this coming week, Lord, let us be faithfully present in this moment with an ear that is tuned to you and a heart that is ready to receive your word. We ask God that you would change us. Lord, let this not just be a, a, a time that we just put in and, and then go our way, but let it be a, a, a changing, a, a moment in our life that we never forget, a time that you really grabbed a hold of us. I ask God that we would e be eagerly expecting and praying for that. I ask, Lord, that you would just, just lead us to, to, to really mean these words to, to, uh, that we sing, and again, that we would be ready to hear from you as we get into your word. Lord, bless us. For your glory and our benefit, we pray. Amen. It seemed a little Catholic, didn't it? <clears throat> All right, let's sing.
who else demands all the host of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper in darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy for.
worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes.
God's righteousness revealed. The Son of Man, the Son of God, His kingdom. Bye. 
Father God, we thank you for your kingdom, Lord. We thank you um, for loving us and for saving us and for our salvation, Father. We thank you for this day and this opportunity to be here and to worship you, Lord, and to hear your word. Um, God, we just ask that you speak through Kellis, cause us to hear you, and we give you the glory for all of it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, guys. You guys have heard this question before. I like to ask it to myself, really. That's where I, I was asked this question, and I kept asking myself, and now I like to ask you guys, do you really believe that what you believe is really real? How many of you guys have heard me ask that question? Do you believe that what you believe is real? Or, or Let's add a couple more reallys. Do you really, really believe that what you believe is really, really real? And if so, I mean, that's a hard question, especially when, th- when times are tough. And, and we were talking about the promises of God, and, and, and do we have any that we cling to, that we claim, that we really just pray, Lord, you said this, I need to believe it, I'm having a hard time right now. Okay, let's say you are there at that spot, and you really believe. Next question, why? Why do you believe that what you believe is really real? That's kind of what I want to talk about, but beyond dispute, Christianity is, was a movement that, that started back in Jerusalem. We know some of that story, but it spread to the entire world and literally changed the world. I mean, like Christianity has, has it, had an impact on governments, on nations. It, it literally has, has shaped the world. That's a historical fact. We can see the impact, the effects of Christianity that that spread from Jerusalem. It's beyond dispute. And I would say, again, it's beyond dispute. At the center of that movement was a claim of a crucified and risen Savior. That was the message that that just was set ablaze and spread out. It's beyond dispute. We know that's what happened. What can be argued today and is often argued is whether or not that claim of a resurrected savior is true did he really come back to life now i i don't think if you guys are struggling with that maybe you are surprisingly low there are a lot of people who struggle with that we've had people come give their life to the lord after you know, a gospel invitation or whatever, you know, I'm like, hey, I want to meet up with you, I want to follow with you with this, this claim, this or this this decision that you're making today. Let's meet tomorrow. We start talking. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus and all, but I don't believe he rose from the dead. Whoa, that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> a lot of people argue with that. So you'll hear an unbeliever or a skeptic, they'll say, well, I don't really believe that because, well, let's just be frank, I, I need proof. I, I need it to be proved to me to be absolutely sure before I believe. You might hear someone say, you know, I, I'm not really a person of faith. I believe in science. <laughs> and I think that doesn't really line up with science. I mean, that's fair, right? I mean, I, I, I get where they're coming from. I, I, it's, we're living 2021. I, I want to show me the facts, show me the proof. But let's talk about that real quick. What, what is this idea that science always gets it right? I mean, that's just a myth. Anybody in science or who's taken a science class knows they don't always get it right. I mean, that's, that's kind of the point, right? We're constantly learning. The reality is science is constantly discovering and rediscovering and building on itself. The whole basis of science is that they're constantly adjusting and correcting and observing and discovering more. It's okay it's okay that the science can be wrong sometimes. I mean, that's the point. We want to, it's a continual pursuit of, of reality or of truth. The whole basis, again, just think, think about things 100 years ago that were scientifically true. That now, with the advancements of, of, of technology and things, we can look back and we can say, well, that's not really true, actually. This is true. And so there's nothing wrong with that. 
It, that's the nature of it. Now that we get more modern equipment, more research, we have to go back and say, actually, science wasn't true. Science was off. Science has to be corrected. So we continue to adjust, we continue to grow, we continue to learn. Again, it's not a put down. I, I support science. I love science. Stand back. I'm about to do science. You know, so it, it's, just, it's just one of these things where it's constantly growing and it's changing and correcting and discovering. Here at Berean Fellowship, that's, that's kind of what we're all about. Like, like, let's constantly search scriptures to make sure what we believe is true. That we're, 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 how we interpret scriptures, let's, let's test it, let's check it. That's okay. But if someone says, I need absolute proof to believe, to believe that that person or that, that, that the resurrection of Jesus did happen, I would be interested in knowing, okay, what is your absolute proof? If you need absolute proof before you can believe that Jesus rose from the dead, what is it that you need, right? Or like, what is, what is what's, what's your, your parameter or what, what are the things you're looking for? What, what do I need to show you? What do I need to tell you? What is your absolute proof? I'd be interested in knowing what that is. Some people will say, well, science has proven that people don't rise from the dead. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think it has. I think science absolutely has not proven that. I think science cannot prove miracles don't exist. That's kind of the idea of a miracle. It's unexplainable. <laughs> so how can it prove they don't exist? It can't. Does that make sense? All right. I would suggest that the unbeliever or the skeptic probably has hundreds, hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of beliefs that guide their everyday choices that really have no absolute proof to support them. They're just their own opinions. Does that make sense? They're not based on absolute proof. There's so many things that we, that we trust, that we believe in, that, that guide our daily lives to make, help us make decisions that are based on things that we do not have absolute proof on. Most people at the end of the day, their beliefs, their worldview, uh, just the, the sense of reality is based on nothing more than their opinion or maybe the opinion of someone else who has had an influence on them. I actually find that frightening. I mean, I have it too, but I like to discover these things. I, li I like to know. I want to know what I believe and, and why I believe it. Uh, we just travel through your life and you're making some of the most significant choices uh, around the things that just may create your worldview, the things that are going to shape you, to even maybe determine your eternal destiny. How could you allow that to be based on something that's just your opinion or the opinion of someone else? Again, we're not talking about like what team to root for when you grow up, you know, or, or, or what's your favorite restaurant, or do you like Italian or Mexican? This is not you know, like, 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 this is your eternal destiny. Why would you just be settled with something that is just opinion? So the question is not really, that we're, the question that we're, that we're getting at is not what you believe, but really, guys, why do you believe it? Why do you believe the things you believe? Now, this, this can be tiresome. Some of you already are like, I'm not that self-aware, or, or <laughs> I just... That's hard, you know, like hard to really back up and look at like, what do I believe? Why do I believe? Where did I get this from? It takes work. But again, think about what we're talking about. This isn't just, you know, what do you prefer jeans or khakis? You know, like, why do I prefer khakis? You know, when you, you try them out, you know, it's going to be something more than that. We're talking about eternal destiny of your soul. So it's not so much what you believe, but why do you believe it? All right. If you guys have your Bible, that's what I want to talk about. Let's turn to Second Peter chapter 1. We're going to pick up in verse 12, and this opens with the word, therefore. You guys want to say that with me? Therefore. This is a reference to what we've already been talking about. He's building on this, and that's the gospel truth. This is something that he's laid out for us. It's the gospel truth, these wonderful and magnificent truth that we've been talking about and, and claiming and trying to apply to our lives. He says in verse 1 through 11, therefore I will, well, I don't think that's verse 1, therefore I will always be ready to remind you of these things. Yeah, thank you, verse 11. I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. 
and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right, as long as, I'm, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure you will be able to call these things to mind. So Peter is saying it's, it's his job to remind them again and again of what's true. He clearly says, I mean, he's like, I know you know this. You know these truths. We've gone over them. You believe these things. I, I, I agree with that, but it's necessary still to remind you of these things. How many of you guys I mean, got kids? This is like deja vu. I told you. You can't go outside and play in the snow without your shoes. I know, Dad. So put your shoes on. Put a jacket on before you go outside. I know, I know, I know. And then I look out the window, and guess what they're not wearing? So you have to remind them over and over and over. I mean, that's just what I see right there. It's like telling a child this, and 10 minutes later, you got to tell them again. And I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe you don't know. <laughs> You know these words, but maybe you don't believe them. You don't accept them. Or, or you'd be wearing boots. So he's, he considers it right. Like, like, this is his responsibility. Like, this is, this is my role. This is how I serve you. This is what I'm going to be doing. And he says, as long as he's in this earthly dwelling, some of your translations might actually use the word earthly, maybe a tent. Like, like I'm in this tent. I, I, I like that, actually. I think it helps bring the imagery to mind, but he says, as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling, it's right for me to remind you. He's using a metaphor that his body's like a tent. It's it's temporary. He's living in a tent, and it, but he says it's about to be laid aside. It's actually a clothing metaphor. So uh, even though it's a tent, you know, he's ta it's actually a clothing metaphor that it's actually it's something that's going to be taken off of his body, and, and he's talking about his death. It's and he's saying like it's coming. It's imminent. There's a little background here. He actually mentions that Jesus talked to him about this, and Jesus did. He actually asked him about, like, how would I die? And Jesus gave him, you know, some insight into that so he, so he knows how he's going out. Um, we don't need to get into that. He kind of mentions it. But he, he, he's saying, like, like I, I'm dying soon. I'm, I'm coming to the end. I, I can see it. I know it's coming. My concern is that when I'm gone, Will you still hold to the truth, or will you allow these false teachers to lead you astray? That's his concern. I mean, he loves these people, and like he's like, I want to give my all to making sure you're not led astray. In verse 15, he says he needs to be diligent. Let's say that word together, diligent. He says, I need to be diligent before the, the, my departure to remind you of the truth. This is actually the third time. We've seen this word. So if you're studying the Bible, if you're making your marks in it, this is repetition. You see this word coming up, and, and so you red flag it, and you're like, okay, this is, a, this is important to him because he's using this word so often. We see it in verse 5. We see it in verse 10. And basically in verse 5 and 10, it, it says that we as believers, so the recipients, need to be diligent. We need to be diligent to understand. We need to be diligent to believe. This is where talking about, okay, maybe you're already getting tired. Oh, you really want me to be, you know, put in the work to figure out what I believe and why I believe it? Yeah, I do. I want you to be diligent. This is important. Be diligent. And so he uses that in verse 5 and 10. But now he says that he needs to be diligent. He needs to put in the work as well to remind them. This is, what, guys, this is why we gather on Sunday mornings. We don't gather just so we could show the people driving by, look how many people we got, or, or, or whatever. I don't know what a, for whatever lame reason there could be why we gather. We gather so that we can remind each other, that we can be diligent together, that we can help each other. We gather to worship. We gather to encourage one another. We, we gather to remember what is true. That's why we fill our songs with it. That last song, I never heard it before. It was amazing. I love it. Let's, let's add that to the list. Good. It just, just like we were just singing so much truth. God's righteousness revealed. That's why we sing songs like this that are rich, that are not, you know, just shallow, you know, inch high and a, and a mile wide. Is that, is, that, is that the phrase? 
We, we gather to remember. So it's my job, literally, but like my calling to help remind you guys of what's true. That's why we go verse by verse and I'm explaining it. It's your job then to be diligent, to listen, to obey, to, to really like, like as, as, as if I pray for you guys, that you would be faithfully present so that you're able to listen and accept it and chew on it, write it down, take notes. Because every day, guys, think about it. Every day we are bombarded by lies. They're everywhere. You, you, you're carrying them around. You're, you already got them. You're lying to yourself. I mean, but when you go out, listen to the news, on social media, go in the checkout line. I mean, they're just everywhere. There's so many lies. And we're bombarded by it. There's false teachers around us everywhere. And it's critically important that we remember what's true. And we're constantly searching it and making sure that we know what's true. So that's the first paragraph. Starting in, in verse 16, uh, Peter, I want, I want to say Paul, is, is moving the discussion into the source of truth. So this is the why we believe. And so where is Peter getting this truth? Where did he find it? Where did he pick it up? And this is really going to contrast Peter with the false teachers. He's saying, like, my source is more pure. I I'm getting it from somewhere better than you got it. So this is a lot like if you guys were at Mosaic, what, what Paul did. He had to, like, really separate himself from the false teachers and show the source of his truth and where he got the gospel teaching. He did that in, um, in Galatians. So let's go to verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an, an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. I feel like I should say that again. This is my beloved son. That's how I probably imagine I would. It would have been like just deep and and all right. Uh, that's, that's I should not have done that. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter is saying that his source of truth comes from Jesus Himself. You can't get it from a better source. Jesus said, why did he come to earth? I came to testify to the truth. I came to, 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 to reveal and to shut down just what is true and shutting down what is false. So Peter, though, Peter is one of these core disciples. I mean, he's been, in, he's been in the mix from the beginning. And he got the message directly from Jesus himself. Now, now this, this band of disciples that have been with Jesus, like, it's dwindling. They're starting to die and be killed. And so th th it's already, you know, it was a small number essentially, but it's getting fewer and fewer. And Peter's identifying Jesus as his source of truth, and he's saying, I was there. There's not many of us who can say that anymore. So specifically, he's referring here to what is called the, the transfiguration. You guys ever heard of that? Anybody ever not heard of that? The, the, the Mount of Transfiguration? It's like one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's so cool. So they're there. It's, you see it in Matthew. You see it in Mark and Luke. It's this moment when Jesus, they go up on the mountain, and, and he brings uh, Peter, James, and John with him. They go up there, and they're by themselves. And then, like, it starts getting all kinds of crazy. And, and, and he starts, like, transfiguring into, like, his glory. And uh, who, who was it? Elijah and, um, yeah, Moses are there. And, and what well, do you guys remember what Peter said? It is good that we are here. <laughs> We need to, yeah, let's, let's just build a tabernacle of tents. Like, let's just, like, I'm living here. Like, I don't want to leave. This is cool. But then, like, this cloud of glory comes, and that's where, you know, like, I, I try to, like, put, like, the emphasis and just, the, just the, the, the amazingness of that. And he says, this is my beloved son. Listen to what he says. I mean, that was crazy. So that's what he's referring to. It, it's, it's, it, it changed everything. I mean, a lot of people, actually, scholars say that that, like, his ministry really went from there from, like, you know, he was 100% man, 100% God, but maybe from that moment, who started really calling the shots. He was like, I'm making this happen. Like, there's gonna be a donkey there, and you guys go get that donkey, and, and, and you guys, you know, it'll just stop. So that was, like, a pivotal moment, uh, really, really bringing him to the cross after that. 
So this is one of the major themes, though, because Peter is, is referring to this, and he's saying, I remember that, and that gives me so much confidence, and I'm saying he's coming back in that state. And that was, I think, a major theme, because the, the, the false teachers were probably saying, that, I don't think Jesus is coming back. Where is he? He's not coming back. It's just a myth. It's not really true. And Peter, so he's like, I didn't make this up. That's not a fairy tale. This is not a myth. So this is, this is very strategic words here, because in the Greek, that, that was, you know, the, the dominating maybe time, people or the way of thought, they had religions that were full of fables and myths and stories. And so it's a very strategic word where he's saying, it's not any of those. It's not something I made up. Because all of the world religions, even today, have beliefs, right? And that's, that's religion. It's a set, a set of beliefs. But the question is, where do those beliefs come from? Could they be just made up? There's a, there's a major, I don't want to call it religion, denomination, there, there, a church, major church with tons of churches, huge, that literally got its, its extra revelation, because they added on to the Bible, from a dude who put a special rock in a hat, put his face in the hat, and then would come up and someone wrote down what he said. And, and it just went from there. Like, that's craziness. I mean, all right, all right, all right. I don't need, that wasn't the point. Where do these come from? Are they made up? Could they be fantasies? Could they be myths? Peter is saying, I didn't just make this up. I got this out of the mouth of Jesus. This is what he said. And that big cloud told me to listen to what he said. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so he says, we ourselves heard this. This is what in the passage, we ourselves heard this. It's one of those emphatic Greek words. It's like he's, he's underscoring, he's underlining this. He says, I was there. I heard this. I saw this with my own ears, with my own eyes. This is the origin of the message I'm bringing to you. I'm not making this up. Now, part of us, I guess, maybe, we, you know, we all have a little bit of critic in us. And so we ha wondering, well, how do, I, how do I know I can believe Peter? How can I believe Peter more than I can believe that guy, the crazy guy with his head in a hat? You have to assess his character. You have to assess his integrity, his life. Peter is saying, what, he just got done saying this. He is saying, I'm getting ready to die for this cause of Jesus Christ. For this message I heard from Jesus, I'm getting ready to lay my life down for it. All, and in fact, all the apostles, except, except John and, of course, Judas, were executed for their belief. And I say, except John, he didn't escape. He was boiled alive and then left on an island by himself forever for the, until, until he did die. Not a single one of them, guys, died backed off how many of you guys would die for something you made up a, a lie no. why would you why, why would you die for a lie not a single one of them recanted every single one, one of them died filled with hope in their belief of a resurrected and returning jesus christ so peter's about to die for the sake of this gospel do you think in this moment he's just making things up look at look at his life do you think that, 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 that this is just a game to him, he's about to lay his life down for it. So you tell me, well, what are the chances, again, that Peter's telling the truth versus the possibility he's lying and he's willing to die? This is, this is just us reasoning through it. We, we're, we're assessing his life. We're thinking about his integrity. We're thinking about his character. That's the point of the paragraph. This is the origin of the truth, and I'm willing to lay my life down for it. It's real. So where are the false teachers getting their message? Where is that coming from? What's the source of their material? But it's even more than that. Verse 19 says, so we have the prophetic word made more sure. So that means even, even more reliable. To which you do well. I love this passage. I've, I've used it so many times. To which you do well to a pay, a pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day that's the day of the Lord, when he does return, dawns 
and the morning star arises in your hearts, which is another just obscure reference to the Spirit of Christ. So he said, even more than, than Peter as an eyewitness, I mean, that should be enough. He's saying that we've got this whole prophetic witness of the Old Testament that predicted the coming of the Messiah. This prediction and fulfillment is like a light, and it just is spotlighting what he said is true. It's been supported. It's been underlined. We've got all these things that, that make this unique and reliable. You do well to follow it as a light through your life. All the way until the return of Christ where we can see everything illuminated and whole. So what's he talking about? He's talking about, again, the, all of the Old Testament, specifically the prophets. What do we know about these Old Testament prophets? We know absolutely, with, again, beyond dispute, the Old Testament was gathered. Again, these are other letters and, 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 and books, essentially we call them. Um, they were gathered, they were collected, they were completed by the first century. I mean, they were all like just, just it was, what, what's the word? They were, they, were, they were canonized. The Old Testament was complete. They had it in their possession. By the first century, there was a clear sense of, 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 of these books. There was a clear century, uh, uh, sense of, of, of what they were written for. They understood it. They knew it. There were even some rabbis and teachers who had it completely memorized. So it wasn't something that they went back and adjusted to fit Jesus. It was locked down. They had it in their hands. You guys follow me on that? All right. So we know of the historical fact that they were written hundreds of years before the, even the coming of Christ. We know historical reliability outside of like New Testament messianic Christianity that these things were were there and that Jesus then came and fulfilled these prophecies. There's some, I think, and that's fair, there's some disagreement of how many prophecies. Have you guys ever heard this? I mean, there's roughly 70 prophecies that, that, that are specifically referring to the coming of the Messiah that Jesus perfectly fulfilled. Like I said, there, there, there's some debate on, on those exactly how many, but, but let's just throw out a number or, well, let me, let me give you some examples. There was a prophecy of his family lineage. You guys probably knew that one. There was a prophecy that he was going to be born of a virgin. You guys are familiar with that one. There's a prophecy that he was going to be coming from Nazareth. There was a prophecy that he was going to be born in Bethlehem, that the Magi were, were going to come, that, that there was going to be a star. There was a prophecy of what King Herod did or would do. There was a prophecy of how the Messiah would die. There was a prophecy that he would be b b betrayed. There was even a prophecy of how much, how much he'd be paid for the betrayal, where he would be buried. All these things that Jesus could not actually control. How's it? You can't control where you're buried. <laughs> Yet all of them were perfectly fulfilled in, in the life of Jesus. You guys know of any other ones? Say it again. Yeah, yeah, he would go to Egypt and come back. Yeah, for sure. Nice one, good one. Should have had that in there. I, I read this about a mathematician years ago trying to just, I guess, figure out the probability of, of just these happening by chance. So maybe we still got some critics in here. We're like, oh, maybe, you know, just got lucky. The, the guy's specialty was in the law of prob probability. And he set out to just apply this to the, to the prophecies of the Messiah. And he picked eight, just eight of the prophecies, which he actually lists in the study. And he's looking at what, what, what's the probability that just eight of these could have happened by chance. His conclusion. Any guesses? One in ten to the seventeenth power. How many of you guys know any idea of what I just said? <laughs> so the seventeenth power, that's just like, like you, you, you do a ten and then you write seventeen zeros. What is that number even? I mean, is there a word for that number? What is it? Quintillion. Yeah. I'm now trying to spell it. No. <laughs> so that's, he actually, let me, I'll just quote this for you. To illustrate that number, he said, if you took 10 to the 17th power number of silver dollars and you dropped them in the state of Texas, it would go north, south, east, and west 
border to border, two feet thick. That's how many silver dollars across the entire state. One of those coins is marked with an X. Then you get in a helicopter and you fly over the state of Texas, blindfolded. Well, I don't know why you're flying a helicopter. <laughs> Maybe there's someone else flying. You're just in it. Yeah, that makes sense. And you drop it out of the helicopter at the place of your choice. Then you go down and you reach into the pile and you pull out the one coin with the X. That's the odds of 1 to 10 to the 17th power. And that's just eight of the prophecies. He decided then to go to 48. This conclusion that the odds are 1, to t- one in 10 to the 157th power, which is... <laughs> I mean, who does? I mean, seriously, guys, if you're taking notes, try and write that down. You go 10, 157 zeros. I mean, how many even, oh, you figure out how many comments. I mean, that's just, that's, that's, that's insane. He says the ability to illustrate that is just so ginormous. It's, it, it's, it's beyond comprehension. I, I, I can't even, I can't even think of something that you would understand that, that would help us understand is just how, like, Impossible that is. The reality is, it just, it's just, we can't understand this. There's no way that this could just be made up and, and something that he could have done by chance other than that this is a divinely inspired prophetic work that God was a part of making happen and Peter was there as an eyewitness and he heard this truth and he's bringing it to us. Verse 20. But know this first of all. So that means really like this is super important. This is a big deal. That no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. What he means is uh, you, you can't just make the Bible, guys, say whatever you want it to say. This is a big deal. It really is. Sometimes you hear people say, you know, like, w- what does the Bible mean to you? I feel like, unfortunately, we say this a lot of times in, in, in small groups, in Bible studies. Well, what does this say to you? What does this mean to you? It's a bad question. The question ought to be, what does the Bible mean? What is the author trying to say? What did God intend for us to hear? What did he mean by it? God has something specific he wanted to say, he went out of his way to, to breathe it into, to inspire the writers, to write it down, and it's our job to figure out his message. Now, you may share, how does this apply to you? How does this affect you? Those are good questions, but I don't care what you think it means, because your opinion is not what I'm after. I want the message that came for out of the mouth of Jesus. Sorry to be rude. But it's true. No, I'm not sorry. I ain't sorry. No. So this is, this is important in our culture. I mean, I, I, the part of the fabric of our postmodern, modern, whatever culture is, is just the, the meaning is actually based upon the interpreter. And I've shared this before. This actually went to court. It, it, was, a, it was a rapper who someone who knew the rapper thought that maybe the lyrics were a threat to that person. And, and the rapper was like, no, that's not even meaning that at all. But it actually went to court to who gets to determine the meaning of, of the message. And so and I was like, whoa, h- how is this seriously going to court? Regardless of, of, of what the writer intended, today, in a lot of our small groups, and, and, and just, just like this isn't just our culture, we are free to twist it into whatever we want it to say. It's the same as when you look at a piece of artwork, right? It doesn't matter what the painter intended the artwork to mean. It, it, it's, it's what does it say to us? What does it mean to us? That Peter is saying that's not true. There is an intent by the writer, God, and, and, and there's a meaning to this text. And we ought to be diligent to understand it. Verse 21, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved. Again, that's a word they used to describe like the wind blowing, maybe a sailboat 
across the tree, men inspired and motivated and energized by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This is, again, this is one of the most critical texts in the New Testament, in my opinion. It reminds us that, guys, the Bible is not just a collection of someone's opinions, but actually men who were moved by the very breath of God to write exactly what God wanted them to write. One of the, the, the beauties of the Bible, again, it is written by people who, who had different backgrounds, who had different educations and styles and personalities, and you see that reflected in their writing. God doesn't just like override them and turn us into robots, but within that, the Spirit of God breathed through them in order that they wrote exactly what God intended them to write. In order, just as the, the Scriptures could claim this authoritative and inspired and reliable word for us in a culture that he's not surprised by that questions what is truth well i have a reliable source right here in front of me and i'd love to talk to you about it several years ago i was having a conversation with a friend actually a lindsey wilson student uh was in christian ministry major um i would describe him as as a maybe a baby christian because because mid mid conversation we were talking about something in the New Testament, and this is what he says. Well, that's just Paul's opinion. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm, so, I'm sorry, what? What did you just say? I mean, really, I remember it just took me back, and I was like, oh, man, like, we got to back up, bro. We are not on the same page here. Like, like, that's just Paul's opinion. I don't have to agree with that. And I realized this, he failed to understand one of the most basic foundational beliefs of the Christian faith. The Bible is not a collection of man's opinions. It's the authoritative, inspired word of God. We you thank you. Amen. Yeah. Can I get an amen? amen? We usually say right on, but we're just pulling out all the stops. I need an amen. <laughs> That's one of the things we had, we had in our covenant when we used to have a, like a membership covenant. Like if you ever feel like something was, was not being said right, that was, was contrary to Scripture, we ask you, we covenant with you, that you would raise a red flag, that you would say something. Because Scripture is our authority, not Kellis, not the elders, Scripture. So anyways, we'll, we'll get back to this. Jesus claimed that the Scriptures were the Word of God. The Scriptures claimed to be the Word of God. The prophets we're declaring the word of God. This is God-breathed, miraculous word of God. There's no other to explain things like this prophecy. There's no way they could have just made it up and these things happen. It had to have been God's inspired word. So just the amazing reliability of archaeology. I think I, I brought that up a little bit on one of the, uh, maybe last week or the week before, Mosaic. Just the reliability of, of archaeology and history and then science again and again just demonstrating that the scriptures are true. There's a lot of truth in there. So the fact of the matter, guys, this morning, you guys, you, you're free to believe what you want to believe. You really are. You're created in the image of God. And God has given you the freedom to believe what you want to believe. He's given you that capacity. But I would ask you just to consider, what's the source of what you believe? As tiresome as that might be, you got to answer that question. Why do you believe or not believe what it is you believe? Most people go through life, just this pathway of life, by will, and they're directed nothing more than just opinion or fads or social media or the influence of people around them. Even their eternal destiny, where they're going to spend eternity, is based on nothing more than just opinions ill thought out or not thought out, not contemplated, not, not, not considered, just opinions. I did talk about this this past week. Well, that's what's always what I was told. You really going to take that to the bank? You're going to take that to the bank when it comes to e eternity? Well, that's what I just grew up hearing. Spend some elbow grease. Get into it. What it is it that you believe in? Why do you believe it? Is it actually what God's word said? Who cares if you're Methodist or Protestant or Berean or Baptist? The question we ought to ask is, what did Jesus say? At the end of the day, truth wins. Francis Schaeffer says that. You guys ever heard of Dallas Willard? 
We went through a lot of his teaching when we were going through uh, the Beatitudes. But Dallas Willard used to say, reality is what you run into when you're wrong. <laughs> I really like Dallas Willard. Highly recommend him to you guys. You can believe whatever you want. We, God's given us that capacity. But it doesn't make it true. And are you really, really, <laughs> are you really willing to risk everything on it? Just an opinion. I can only speak for myself, but I will, and I'm wrapping up. For me, I am basing my life and my eternal soul on, uh, on everything that I believe on the authority and the reliability of God's word. Because I know myself. And if it's just what I made up, I, I'm, not, I'm not leaning on it. I'm going to lean on God's word because it is bigger and better than me. And I want to help you guys be able to say the same thing. That you are going to base your life on God's authoritative, reliable word. And then we can help each other actually do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Again, just this reminder of its reliability. And I ask God that we would make the changes. Lord, maybe that's what you're speaking to us right now. Asking us to do the work. Why, do, why are we doing the things we do? Why are we living the way we live? Why are we believing the things we believe? And ask God you would help us become students of your word. Not in, in a legalistic way, but in just in a way like, that, like, like treasure hunters. Just willing to sell everything. To dig up and find that treasure. To know you through information but also experience i ask lord that, that, that searching your word and looking for you and the truth of who you are would be our pleasure it would be our delight it would be the thing that we want to do when we wake up lord make that change in us speak to every one of us right now show us the the things that gotta go show us the idols that have become our our pleasure and I ask, Lord, you would, you would replace them with you. We love you, Jesus. It's all about you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to really encourage you guys to, again, to, to continue talking to people about this. And if maybe there is something that you're just not sure why you believe or there's something, that, that, that a question that has come up, whatever God is speaking to you right now, maybe share it with somebody. Ask them, you know, how, how is this with you? I love this time after our sermon. This is the time that we guys can, can encourage one another, that you can um, speak and share. And here we are, we're about to get blessed. Please, share. Yeah, one of the best proofs, I'm saying from the microphone so other people can hear, one of the best proofs that that is, say it again, the word of God is the nation of Israel. Yeah, so many prophecies with that, too. Goodness, there's just, it's insane. Not insane, but it's amazing. That's, that's what I meant by that. All right, guys, I, 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 I'm begging you. Encourage one another. Lift somebody up. Say something that uh, points them to Jesus. Let's, let's be dismissed, but let's hang out.